So uh, last time we talked quite a bit about the single slit diffraction. So basically the, the setup was that you have a single slit and it has some width A that we cannot neglect. So we can not treat it as like one point particle and then we, we shine light on this. So then different points inside this opening serve as different sources. And that can give rise to, a, to an interference pattern known as the single slit diffraction. So at the central point, there is a maximum. We have the highest intensity. Um, so here, and then, so let's say that's the intensity. So then there are some minima. So let's say this is the P equal one minimum, P equal two minimum, P equal three, P equal three minimum on two sides. And then the condition, so let's say that's, for example, the angle theta two uh, is that theta P for a dark fringe, one of these minima uh, in intensity is given by p lambda over a so we basically showed by kind of pairing up uh, the the waves coming from the different points in different ways that for any integer p um, if that condition is satisfied we're gonna get a dark fringe we haven't proof that there are no other dark fringes, right? So we, we showed that at, at places where we form this theta P, there is a dark fringe, but we haven't showed that there are no others. These are the only ones. It turns out these are the only ones. And we'll spend a bit more time on, on single slit diffraction um, and try to actually get the intensity uh, as a function of position and, and it becomes clear that that this is true so these are the only dark fringes that we get okay so with this formula theta p is equal to p times uh, lambda over a let's do a quick example uh, so we have light from a helium neon laser lambda equal 633 nanometers it goes through a single slit there's a screen two meters behind the slit and the first minimum in the diffraction pattern is 1.2 centimeters from the central maximum. How wide is the slit? Okay, so we know the wavelength, we know the distance to the, to the screen, and we know the position of, of the first minimum in the diffraction pattern. So example 33, three, let's say. <clears throat> okay, so again, in this pattern, say that's the central maximum here. And this is the first minimum, so we know this distance. Let's say we know y1, right? And we know also L. So L is 2 meters. I believe that was 1.2 centimeters from, uh, from the center. And lambda is 633 nanometers, right? So that's our um, slit here. All right, so we wanna find 
A, we want to find the width of the slit. So, so what do we know? Well, we have one formula for this angle, right? This is theta one. If you connect the slit to, to the point where you have the first dark fringe, it's a P equal one uh, case of the general formula. So theta one is going to be lambda over A. And we know theta is a small angle, right? It's 1.2 centimeters, that's two meters. So its tangent is 1.2 centimeters divided by two meters. So therefore we can use a small angle approximation. And this formula is itself valid in, in the regime where we have a small angle approximation. So we know that theta one is approximately 1.2 centimeters over 200 centimeters. So that's going to be point uh, zero. So it's point six over a hundred, right? So it should be point zero zero six. Okay, so we have theta and we know it's lambda over A. So from here, we know A is lambda over theta. So we're done. We can extract the width of the, the slit. So A becomes uh, 633 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 6 times 10 to the minus 3. So that's... Uh, that's whatever it is. And that's in meters. So let's uh, take a look at the, the answer. Yeah, so that's, that's our figure. Uh, and uh, so we find theta to be this, 0 0.006 rad. And then that's that's basically the calculation. So it's 1.1 times 10 to the minus four meters or 0 0.11 millimeters. Um. Okay. So that was a straightforward um, example, just basically plug it into the formula using the, the, the small angle approximation to, to get theta from these two lengths that are given. The position of, of the dark fringe on the screen and the distance to, to the screen. All right. Okay, so then there's another thing like the, the widths of the central bright fringe. Again, we figured out that the, uh, yeah, let's calculate this. It's quite, quite straightforward again. So the width of central bright fringe in single slit diffraction. Right, so we know theta one is lambda over A to this. And again, if we use the, the small angle approximation, we know Y one is L times theta one is L times lambda over A. And if, you know, so going back to this picture, you have the bright central fringe. So here to the first one on this side, you have a distance y1. To the first one on the other side, you also have a distance y1. And then the width of the, this bright region 
w is just twice y1, so that becomes 2L lambda over A. So that's also a useful formula um, to have. And, and similarly, we can find the widths of different bright fringes. It, it just refine the distance between um, consecutive dark fringes. And what's in between is a bright region. All right? OK. So. So given this, this is a quick check. So pause the video and uh, try to find the answer. All right, so those are the, 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 the fringes. We see that diffraction pattern on the screen and we now make the slit narrower. What should happen to the bright fringes? Do they get closer together? They stay in the same position, they move apart. Um, or there won't be any fringes. Well, um, if you make A smaller, right, we just figured out, for example, the width of the, the central one is, um, is L lambda over A times two. So it's divided by A, the width of the fringes in the denominator. So if we make the slit narrower, we move these fringes apart from each other. So the, the bright fringes get wider, right? And of course, in the limit of A going to zero, all these fringes get shifted to infinity. So we just have the one central bright region becomes infinitely wide. And of course, it fades, right? If you have a smaller, um, smaller opening. Okay, so now uh, I want to I want to discuss this section that's an advanced topic. So you're welcome to to skip over this, but I I think um, it's quite useful to understand um, the mathematics of single slit diffraction in in more detail. So let's try to do this math together. Um, okay, so let's say this is an advanced topic. Um, so mathematics of single slit diffraction. So the idea is we have our opening here with A. And we had uh, this notion that, you know, if theta is zero, right, we have the central maximum. So that's because all of these um, these waves are in phase, right? So they add up together. So if I kind of artificially divide this opening into n pieces of with a over n, and ultimately I can make a smaller sorry, n larger and larger and make these, these pieces smaller and smaller. So let's say um, the electric field amplitude for each piece is E. Right, so then what do we add? So our electric field will be something like, let's say, first I have an E, then 
I have E cosine, uh, let's say, let's call it delta phi, right? So let's say I, I start adding from here, right? So the first one, yeah, let's say I pick it at some point where the phase of the phase of the wave reaching the screen from this lowest piece is um, is is zero. So that cosine is one, for example. In general, right, each of them have a structure e cosine k r minus omega t plus some phi naught, right? So. Yeah, so let's say Ej is going to be this, and then the only difference is Rj. Now, the, the, the phase difference between consecutive ones, because they're separated by some A over N, uh, the, the delta R between two consecutive neighboring pieces, right, is going to be, as usual, A over N, the distance, times sine theta. And if we multiply that by K, which is 2 pi over lambda, we get some delta phi between two neighboring waves to be a over n 2 pi over lambda sine theta right so for waves moving in the in the theta direction uh, two neighboring ones have this phase difference so for example if i for if i engineer if i look at a particular time where this one has a cosine that's 1 so let's say this is zero. Then the next one uh, will be a phase delta phi ahead the, the, from this one, right? And then this one will be twice that, right? So the delta r will be now 2a over n sine theta. So then I have e cosine 2 delta phi. And ultimately, when you add all of them, the last one, so we're going to get um, we're going to get n of these. So the last one's going to be yeah, I think it's e cosine n minus 1 times delta phi, right? The first one has 0 times delta phi, 1 times delta phi. The last one is n minus 1 times delta phi, etc. So, uh, so see, I kind of engineered my my phase. I looked at a particular time, so this cosine was one for one of them. If you look at a more general thing, let's say you have this omega t, and of course kr of the first one, there's going to be some phase, right, that gets added to all of them. So e of t, uh, that was engineered in some way but in general it's going to be e times cosine of let's say some phi of t plus e cosine of the same right that's what it means that there's a phase difference of delta phi plus e cosine of the same phi t plus 2 delta phi up to the last one. So that's uh, the general expression, right? And as you can imagine, this is an oscillatory thing, like the electric field at every point is, is oscillating. So what we're interested in is the amplitude of that oscillation, the maximum value it takes. So there is a very useful geometric interpretation, interpretation known as the phaser picture so 
basically, so let's say we think of that cosine as some projection, right, on the x-axis. So take one of these. Um, so let's just consider E cosine phi of t. So if you have a vector of length E, and this is phi of t, that angle is phi of t, it's kind of the relationship between oscillations and rotation. The amplitude is E, right? And as phi of t changes, you know, this whole thing rotates. Um, and this projection on the horizontal axis is, is the cosine. Now, if I have two of them, for example, I have E, so cosine phi of t plus E cosine phi of t plus delta phi. What does that look like? Well, I can imagine one vector like this. Again, some vector of length E. It makes an angle... Uh, phi of t and then there's another vector that gets added to this such that it x component is cosine of phi of t plus delta phi of t so i can imagine this line so here i have my phi of t and then i add the delta phi here i have this second vector right the sum of these these two is this vector like that and as as phi of t changes, this whole thing rotates, and what I'm interested in is that the the x projection, right? That's that's the electric field, but the maximum, the amplitude for this superposition is of course going to be this radius, because at some point, at some time, this vector will be entirely along the horizontal axis. As time goes on, this thing will will keep rotating. So we know. Uh, And then to, to find that, this rotation is kind of irrelevant to find that radius. So we can find the radius by just looking at this triangle. So we can rotate it back. So the first one is here. And then the next one makes an angle delta, delta phi here. E, E. Then geometrically, we can find this superposition. So if that's delta phi, here I have pi minus delta phi. So then this is an equilateral triangle. Each of these is delta phi over two. And therefore, this superposition, the length of the superposition becomes two e, cos, two e cosine delta phi over two, which is the expression we found before, right? When we were looking at the, at the double slit interference so we use this trig identity uh, to find the amplitude of the of the oscillatory field and it ended up to be twice the individual amplitude sine cosine of the phase difference over two so that's a geometric way of getting the same thing and of course as time goes on so that that's something you can get from this expression as time goes on, the, the effect of the time is just rotating this whole triangle, which doesn't change its change the amplitude of the oscillations. All right, so I think we're close to finding the general intensity. So let's consider um, theta equals zero, which corresponds to the central central bright region or central bright let's say fringe so in that case all the delta phi's are zero in this expression so my amplitude will be just n times e And we know that the maximum intensity that we get is proportional to E squared. So it's going to be proportional to N squared E squared. Let's see. 
let's call that also E max for the central maxima. Now, if you're at some angle theta, so we have this expression, well, let's think about this. We, we use the same kind of geometric approach. So I have the first one, then the next one makes some angle delta phi with the first one, then this one makes an angle delta phi with the second one, the next one makes an angle delta phi with this one. So ultimately, the last one with the horizontal makes an angle, um, what is that angle? So it's going to be n minus 1 times delta phi here. Okay, so then the amplitude should be this radius, which um, which is yeah. So we we don't. So let's draw that that uh, geometry again, and we're gonna take the limit of n going to infinity. So we have lots of really tiny pieces, right? So we have, let's call, yeah, let's calculate this. So let's call that angle beta. So beta is n minus one times a over n, two pi over lambda, 2 pi over lambda times sine theta. So in the limit of large n, there's the ratio of n minus 1 and n is basically 1. So beta just goes to 2 pi a over lambda sine theta, right? There's, there's that, that angle that gets formed. And then you know, you arrange these little pieces one after the other. So in the limit of they becoming really tiny, they have the same length and every time the angle shifts, so they form like one arc of a circle. Where tangent to this circle here forms an angle beta. Okay, so let's say the circle has some radius r here. Then if that's beta, um, each of these, let's say this angle here is beta over 2. Therefore, this is perpendicular to this, this is perpendicular to this, so that's going to be beta over 2 as well. So this amplitude, let's call it E from here to here, um, becomes E equal to, see, half of, e, half of E from here to here is R sine beta over 2, right? E over 2 is opposite an angle beta over 2 in this right triangle here with the hypotenuse being equal to r. So e becomes twice r sine beta over 2. And of course then e max, the maximum uh, for theta equals 0, right, was equal to n e. We arrange all of these, right, one after the other. So let's say one, two, three. So here in this picture, I have one, two, three, four, right? So that's E max, which is N E for theta equals zero for the central bright maximum. But here's this connection between the two pictures. See, if you think about the sum of the lengths of these guys, in the limit of n going to, to infinity, you have lots and lots of very tiny pieces one after the other. Uh, that becomes the length of this curve, right? So when 
you take the limit of n going to infinity, n e does become the length of this arc here, which is part of a circle. Right, so if I expand this, if I kind of think of this as a rope, right, and then I stretch it along a, that's kind of curved, if you stretch it along a straight line, you're going to get this picture, which is just n times the length of each of these individual pieces, and that's the amplitude associated with the central maximum. So another important relationship is E max is uh, R times beta, right? This is beta over 2, beta over 2, so this whole angle is beta, and that's a, an arc of a circle, so it's also R times beta. So this unknown radius that we we assumed in this geometric picture is can be eliminated, right? We can write R is E max over beta. So E becomes two E max over beta sine beta over two. We can also write it, write this as E max times sine beta over two divided by beta over two. So then in the limit of beta going to zero, we're just gonna get E max, right? Sine of a small angle divided by that small angle um, goes to one. And of course, when theta goes to zero, we're talking about the central maximum sine of theta is zero, so beta becomes zero. Okay, so we just found this very important relationship, so let me write beta again. Uh, beta is two pi a over lambda sine theta. All right, so if the screen is here, the source is there, the source has some with a, and from the source to some point on the screen, we form some angle theta. If I know the wavelength, I can find this angle beta, right? So it just becomes a function of theta for given, for fixed widths of the, the slit and for fixed wavelength. And then this gives me that the ratio of the amplitude of the electric field arriving at this point here to the amplitude of the electric field at the bright central maximum uh, is sine beta over two over beta over two. Now we know that the intensity is proportional to amplitude squared, so the intensity divided by the maximum intensity over here becomes just that thing squared. Okay. Yeah, so let's go back to, to, to the slides. So review this calculation. It's a bit of a subtle calculation. Um, so that's the example we started with, just having two of these phasers, right? The, 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 the fact of having some other phase omega t added to these is that the whole thing rotates. So we can just look at maybe put the first one along the the horizontal direction and then put the next vector here to find the vectorial sum and then the length of this this vector as it rotates uh, gives us the the amplitude so now now that we have a whole bunch of them uh, each of them with a tiny amplitude small e you know the maximum can be n times e for theta equals zero they just line up along a straight line and when you add up these phasers for some arbitrary theta, which gives then that this angle becomes, it's actually n minus one times that, but we argue in the limit of n going to infinity, that doesn't matter. Uh, so we find this angle beta here, and, and then E becomes, looking at, at the circle, E becomes some radius times 
2 sine of beta over 2 and then this curve which is the same as E naught or E max is the same radius times times beta. So from this we find the important relationship that the amplitude at some point is the maximum amplitude at the center times sine beta over 2 over beta over 2 and then we can plug that in as a function of theta so we have this important relationship that you know at any point on the screen characterized by some angle theta uh, we know we have an expression uh, for the intensity at least we know the ratio of the intensity anywhere to the ratio to, to the to the intensity at the central maximum for theta equals zero all right so that's kind of the the picture that that appears if we plot that that expression so it captures the, the decay that that we see in experiment and then simulations and it also correctly captures the positions of the dark fringes that we calculated before it demonstrates that there are no other dark fringes right so we didn't prove that there are no other in this first uh, derivation where we paired them up in some way we, we showed that all of these ones that we found kind of p times lambda over a corresponds to dark fringe but um, now that we know the full intensity we know that there are no others let's actually check that from our expression so see how we reproduce uh, the same results so dark fringes correspond to well this must be zero so sine beta over 2 is zero where is sine zero well it's at zero at pi at 2 pi so any multiple of pi so beta over 2 must be p some integer times pi what was beta beta was 2 pi a over lambda sine theta beta is 2 pi a over lambda sine theta which is approximately equal to 2 pi a over lambda theta right for a small theta again the small angle approximation which is what we used to find uh, find the expression theta p is equal to p, p lambda over a so from this uh, yeah let's just put these two together so we find one half times beta which is 2 pi a over lambda theta is equal to p pi pi's cancel out one half and two cancel out so from here we get that theta is p lambda over a so integer multiples of lambda over a at least for for small theta well definitely for small theta um, those are the, the positions of the dark fringes and there's and there there is no other dark fringe right because we know the full dependence of of intensity on on theta right so these are um, the positions of the dark fringes all right uh, let's work out a couple of examples so so example one let's say we shine a laser with a frequency sorry um, on a single slit what is the um, maximum slit width for which we don't get any minima any dark fringes for which we don't get dark fringes
okay so so how can we figure this out well we had an expression for the position of the dark fringes in the small theta limit, but we also had it in the more um, more general theta limit, right? So basically, if I don't make sine theta to be equal to theta, then again, the condition is beta over 2 is p pi. So for dark fringe, for a dark fringe, in general, beta over 2 is some integer times pi, and beta was 2 pi a over lambda, 2 pi a over lambda sine theta, right? So if you have your slit here, the screen is there, if I get a dark fringe at some angle theta, uh, I must have one half two pi a over lambda sine theta to be equal to p times pi, an integer times pi. So if I simplify this, it means sine theta, right? One half cancels with two, pi cancels with pi, must be p lambda over a. Okay. So if I don't get uh any any dark fringes it means there are no solution to this equation right so if a is large right of course there's going to be quite a few solutions because we know sine of theta so if i pick the positive side right theta goes from zero to pi over two for example at infinity um, sine goes between zero to one so there are solutions um, if you know this quantity is between zero and one and then i can find an angle theta so yeah so clearly if a is large enough that side is small right and there's going to be quite a few solutions but if you make a larger than sorry if you make a smaller right then at some point, you know, you're going to lose solution. So if lambda over a, for example, becomes larger than 1, then, you know, p is 1, 2, 3, etc. So then for p equal 1 is larger than 1. Therefore, for all other p's, it's larger than 1. We're not going to find any solution. So the critical value, the... Um, for for a where you know you lose find you you don't find solutions anymore is when theta equal pi over two is a solution for p equal one it's basically when lambda equal lambda over a becomes one right because if lambda over a is smaller than one at least for p equal one we have a solution p times lambda over a will be smaller than 1, and then we can find the arc sine, and there is a solution. Um, let's say if lambda over a is smaller than 1 half, then there are two solutions, like p equal 1 and p equal 2. But um, so no solution for lambda over a larger than 1. That means that a is smaller than lambda, right? To have no no solution. So the, the largest A where there is no solution, uh, the maximum weights for which there are no solution is the weights equal to lambda. So let's call that A max, is lambda. And if the frequency is F, the wavelength is just C over F. Okay, so here's a second example on the diffraction grating. So this, it says light of uh, wavelength equals 620 nanometers aluminous a diffraction grating. The second order maximum is at angle 39.5 degrees. How many lines per millimeter does the grating have? 
right? So remember the grating has a bunch of has a bunch of openings that they're also called lines, right? And the distance between them is D. And then we put the screen here, and then at some angle, we're gonna get these uh, these maxima. So the condition for a maximum was D sine theta m, right? If you form, let's say, some angle theta m, is m times lambda, right? That's the condition for constructive interference. The difference in the path length traveled must be a multiple of lambda. All right, so we know theta, we know the angle, we know m is equal to, because it's a second order maximum, we know the wavelength. So we can find d, the distance between the lines on, on the diffraction grating. So d becomes 2, right? So m is equal to 2 here, times 620 times 10 to the minus 9, that's in meters, divided by sine of 39.5 degrees. I think this becomes 1.95 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Now, if I have n lines in 1 millimeter, right, n times the distance between the lines must be 1 millimeter. So n therefore becomes 10 to the minus 3, which is 1 millimeter, divided by this. Uh, so it's 10 to the 3 over 1.95. Um, and that's equal to, I think, 513. All right, uh, I think that's a good place to stop.